The Shooting Range. In this episode, a spooky story of the only nighttime triple ace pilot of the Allies, the IS-1, and how it all began. Hotline, the developers answer questions that you've left in the comments. But first, let's start with how to switch easily to the new vehicles from the update 1.71. The update 1.71 brings us a lot of new tech. Let's find out which tanks one should drive in order to easily switch to the new machines. We'll start with the M50 on toes, a deadly tank destroyer with six recoilless guns. The closest equivalent here would be the Japanese Type 60, the one we've already talked about in one of the previous episodes. Those two function on the very same principles, but the Ontos is much more protected from machine gun fire. Then, the Object 120 and the Waffenträger, two extremely powerful tank destroyers with amazing armament and very thin armor. If you're waiting for those, try playing German tank destroyers with open cockpits, such as the, the Nashorn and the Sturer Emil. They too should be played with caution and from long distances. Next on the list of the new tank destroyers is the T114 with an autoloader and recoilless gun. This one is a bit trickier. Say, if we combine the Zut 37 and the Chiri 2 or the M18 and the Type 60, the result would turn out as agile, maneuverable and extremely deadly as the T114. This vehicle is not suited for the gameplay at the front line. But you already knew that, didn't you? That's it with tank destroyers, but we're also waiting for the BMP-1, the Soviet amphibious infantry fighting vehicle. This one is quite unique, but you can always find some similarities if you know where to look. And we recommend looking at the PT-76 and the Object 906. They can swim as well, and are also equipped with powerful but light guns. The BMP-1 is essentially an upgraded version of those two, but with the ATGMs. Lastly, the new tanks, the T-64, the MBT and the M-60. Those are the most simple of all to get ready for. Basically, drive anything you like. The new protection types will make the tank sturdier and more robust, but essentially, the gameplay won't change. With one exception, try to switch from HEA T-shells to the APDS FS ones. Those will be your main ammunition on the new vehicles. And now, let's go to the UK and remember the story of the only nighttime triple ace fighter pilot of the Allied forces? This will get spooky. On the Battle of Britain Day, 15th of September 1940, the Germans suffered enormous losses due to the airstrike on London. After that, the Luftwaffe changed their strategy. They painted their bombers black and switched to night attacks with the help of radio navigation systems. It was a hard time for the British fighter pilots because it was nearly impossible to locate the enemy in the dark sky without the proper tech. And so, the British started producing fighters with AI radars. At first, they re-equipped the Blenheims and then the bow fighters. Those became the only hope for the RAF pilots in hunting those Dorniers, Junkers and Heinkels during the night time. At least, everybody thought so. But there was one pilot in the Royal Air Force who became the exception to all the rules. A scary, inexplicable, even mystical exception. He was called Richard Plain Stevens. Plain, <laughs> how lucky is that? He was a hurricane pilot of the 151st Flying Squadron of the RAF. Some say that before the war he was an adventurer. They say he traveled to Australia, worked as a policeman in Palestine, and by the age of 30 he had already seen it all. He decided to settle down, and by that we mean got a pilot's license and took the worst job possible flying newspapers and express mail between London and Paris. 
Some people just can't relax. He turned out to be the best man for the job, and nothing could prevent him from getting there on time, be it night or storm. Even then, people thought he was bewitched. He joined the RAF only in October 1940. Why? Nobody knows for sure. James Edgar Johnson, soon to be the most efficient British ace pilot, said that Richard Stevens lost his wife and children during one of the first Luftwaffe night strikes on Manchester. Others spoke of different losses. Anyway, a 31-year-old Stevens became a war pilot. He was a lot older and more experienced than the other fighter pilots of his squadron. On the ground, he was always quiet and brooding. But as soon as he saw a German aircraft, he was ready to tear it apart, regardless of whether he was alone and outnumbered. At night, he turned into something bone-chilling. His comrades were scared to fly in the dark, but Stevens couldn't stay on the ground as the sun was going down. Flying a one-engine hurricane without radar, alone, and in a pitch black night, he somehow managed to find and shoot down German bombers. His first victim was a Dornier 17 on the 16th of January 1941. After that, he grounded two Heinkel 111s on the night of the 8th of April, and two nights later, another Heinkel and a Junkers 88. Something uncanny and sinister was flying in the dark English skies, shooting down Luftwaffe bombers one by one. No trace of bullets, no distinguishable markings, just a black ghost with traces of German blood on the front end. Stevens was flying with some grim delight, giving the shivers to the other pilots of his squadron, not to mention the rumors that the Germans were spreading about him. By the end of June 1941, the bombardment of Britain almost ceased, as the Luftwaffe pilots were relocated to Europe for the Barbarossa operation. But Stevens wasn't happy with this. Allegedly, he even asked to be assigned to the USSR army so he could keep hunting the Germans. But they didn't let him. So he became the first of the British pilots who were raiding continental Europe at nights. The German pilots who survived encountering him told stories about a single black hurricane, but nobody believed them. And to be honest, who would? It didn't make any sense. But the German planes kept burning and falling, and the radio kept transmitting the screams of dying pilots. One day, they had to believe. It was the 15th of October 1941, when they found another grounded Junkers 88 in the Netherlands, and next to it, a wrecked black hurricane and a body of a pilot with an ID of one Richard Stevens. In his logbook, there were 14 grounded aircraft. The Jungus was the 15th. The hurricane wasn't shot down. Stevens didn't have any ammo left, and by the looks of it, he preferred to ram the enemy instead of letting him go. Shocked and devastated Germans buried him with all due honors. Richard Stevens became the only nighttime triple ace pilot in all of the Allied armies, by himself, in the dark, without radar. Nobody could beat his record, even flying on special night modifications of the Bowfighters, the Nighthawks, the P-61s, or the Mosquitoes. How did he manage to do it? We're not sure if there's a rational explanation, and don't even try to look for it. There are places you just can't go back from. Next, we remember the creation of one of the most famous Soviet tanks. There's a common belief that at the beginning of the war, the Soviet tanks were better than the German ones in every way possible. Well, the Soviet government surely didn't think so. Stalin himself said that, yeah, the Soviet tanks are better than all the others, including Germans, when you compare the technical data. But when it comes to the actual running performance, the Soviets can't compete with the others. And Stalin believed that the main job for the modern tanks was to run without braking at least 150 to 200 kilometers at a time, and no matter the state of the ground beneath the tank. So he ordered the development and upgrade of the existing machines and specifically into improving the running gear. Strictly speaking, he was right all along. 
For example, the KV-1 series was shut down exactly because it wasn't agile and reliable enough. As a substitute for the KV-1, the Soviet engineers developed two new tanks. The first one we've already discussed in previous episodes. It was the KV-1S. It didn't fix all the problems of the original KV-1, but they've made enough changes to get it straight into production. As for the second one, it was called the KV-13, or sometimes the IS-1. Its design had some crucial differences compared to the KV-1, combining the best solutions for the heavy and medium tanks. This vehicle actually fulfilled the dream of the Soviet Army. They've been begging for a heavy tank with weight and size of a medium one. The KV-13 weighed about as much as a T-34 and had a similar gun, but the frontal cast armor was 120 millimeters thick. The tests weren't promising. On the one hand, the KV-13 reached the top speed of 55 km an hour, which was amazing for a heavy tank. On the other hand, it had a lot of construction flaws, and the quality of assembly was awful. They had to fix braking parts all the time. And on top of that, the driver wasn't very comfortable either. For example, he had to push the clutch pedal with a force of about 90 kilograms. As they were fixing all that, the army suddenly remembered that they'd initially wanted a three-man turret instead of a two-man turret. Okay, no problem. Let's make them this turret, and since we're doing it, let's also correct some flaws of the previous models. For example, in the turret of the KV-1S, there was no hatch in the commander's cupola. All three members of the turret crew had to use the only hatch, which would be quite useless if somebody, say, hit the tank with an explosive shell and started a fire. Of course, the event would be highly unlikely. It's not like there was a war or something. Oh, uh, anyway, the engineers added a big cupola with an extra hatch for the new turret. The new prototype was finished by the beginning of 1943 and went into testing. By that time, they completely ditched the possibly unlucky number 13 and officially named the tank the IS-1. It also had a brother, the IS-2, with a different turret and a 122mm howitzer. But both of them didn't go into production like this. First, the army required more changes in the running gear, and second, in January 1943, they captured two brand new German Tigers. And hold a thunk, the 76mm gun was absolutely useless against those, unlike the 85mm anti-aircraft gun. So now the engineers had to develop a new 85mm main gun, which, yeah, you guessed it right, didn't fit into the new turret. They had to recreate the hull and widen the race ring up to 180 millimeters. And then the IS-1 was finally ready. So as it turns out, the KV-13 didn't go into production but started the unique IS series. The only new tank family that was created from scratch during the wartime went into production and actually got to fight on the front lines. Get ready for the traditional last part of our show, Hotline. Developers answering questions from the comments. The first question comes from a player called Gaming Saba Saba. Wait. So Germany, Japan and Britain don't have any Rank 6 tanks yet? Will you add some soon? Well, the MBT-70 in the American tree was developed by both Germany and the USA, so it'll be playable for Germany as well, under the name of Kampfenpanzer 70. As for the other nations, we'll announce everything when it's done. Forest Boy asks, Why is your game free? Hi, Forest Boy. The thing is that every game, especially an online one, lives and thrives only as long as its community does. This way, our community grows larger and stronger every day without having to pay a subscription fee and other mandatory stuff. Then there is a question from SlimeDude29. I bet you won't read this, but if you do, please answer. Can the A36 have HVAR rockets mounted on the wings? Hey SlimeDude29. First of all, we did read your question. 
And secondly, if the plane could really carry this type of rocket, then sooner or later we will add this option. And the last serious question comes from a player that goes by the name of The Data Chip. A question to our new host of the shooting range. What's a name that we can call you by? I feel like we need to know your official name. Okay, everybody else calls me Bruce. But you, you can call me Larynx. That's it for today, but feel free to write your questions in the comments below. We do read them all, and you might see some of them answered in the next episode. If you like what we're doing, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you on The Shooting Range.